Hi, everybody. Uh, so welcome to uh, the latest episode of uh, Build Beyond uh, for you know, hosted at Checkout here. So um, just let me make a, a very brief intro to myself. So I'm Sean. Uh, I'm a SVP of product here at Checkout. Uh, and one of the areas that I look after is our authentication uh, products. Uh, so that involves SCA uh, and our uh, compliance towards uh, yeah, PSD2. Um, you know, we uh, are really you know lucky to have a, a great panel here today to, to talk about um, you know, SEA, how it's evolving, all the things that are happening in the market with there, and yeah, the challenges that it's bringing as well. So uh, just to, to talk through who's who's on the call today, uh, we have Dean Jordan, uh, who's Director of Payments at Microsoft, Oliver Steely, Head of Payments at Marks and Spencers, uh, and Thomas Zink, who's an analyst at IDC. Um, guys, it'd be great if I could uh, kind of go around the room and uh, get you to introduce yourself and maybe also kind of give some color as to sort of uh, how SEA affects you and, and your sort of role in the, in the payments uh, flow. So um, uh, maybe Dean, if I could go to you first. Yeah. Hey, morning, everyone. Thanks, Sean. Yes. Yeah, so, uh, Dean Jordan at Microsoft. Um, I work in our payments org. I have both product and payment operations responsibility. One of the things I led over the last two, two and a half years was our, you know, PSD2 program in Europe. So I've been quite deep in um, everything that's been going on the last couple of years uh, with related to strong customer authentication in Europe. Great. Thank you, Dean. Um, Oliver, how about you next? Hi, good afternoon. Good morning, everybody. Um, Oliver Steely, Head of Payments at uh, Marks & Spencer in the UK. Um, my focus is predominantly on the types of tender that we accept as a retailer across all of our channels. Um, uh, as well as looking after some of the enterprise-wide initiatives um, and regulatory matters as far as payments and schemes are concerned. So PSD2 compliance falls uh, within, my, within my purview. So I've been overseeing the, uh, the, the UK launch of our um, SCA capability over the last couple of months. Great. Thank you, Oliver. Uh, and Thomas? Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Tom Zink. I'm leading IDC's European Financial Services Research from that perspective, I take a closer look at what how issuers and acquirers are dealing with payments and SCA for that reason. And obviously, it's a much bigger topic uh, with fraud monitoring uh, really being a key theme. And SCA really, for me, is the one of the next milestones on this PSD2 journey and open banking journey and embedded finance journey. So it's really good that we are moving past this uh, deadline that's been moved various times for sure i think right great thank you guys and, and you know a great panel so um just going to start off with a sort of pretty broad question about uh you know so we've seen the the rules in europe uh, come into effect with psd2 um you know the the main sort of uh, answer to that has been 3ds uh you know sort of uh, the various versions of that you know roll out um just interesting in your opinions of sort of seeing how 3DS has evolved from from V1 now to where we are with 2.2, um, and and how that you know how that's uh, you know affected you know, customers, how that's affected you, uh, and sort of you know what those the changes in in uh, and the evolution of 3DS has, has meant to you. Um, so maybe Thomas, if I could start with you there. Yeah, uh, so I, I don't really see a mindset shift yet. And I, I think what is, it's a logical evolution that merchants will warm to it as they get more familiar with it. And as we are basically finding uh, a way of doing business in this new environment. I mean, there will be a lot of confusion in the beginning. There will be a lot of learning on everyone's end, whether that's the issuer, the acquirer, the merchant, or the consumer. Arguably, most of the learning will be on the, on the consumer's end. But the nice thing is obviously that 3DS uh, 2.1 uh, or 2.2, they are making it a lot easier and a lot more frictionless. And they allow several instances of, of really making this a, a much better customer experience. And therefore, it's really... Um, given the cost that that entire exercise cost on the one hand, there is this major incentive to move forward in an environment where fraud is a constant moving target and uh, attackers and fraudsters, they are getting smart about it. And uh, the more we can kind of, oh, the more difficult we can make it for them, the, the better it is ultimately. But obviously customer experience is the, the biggest challenge uh, to enable that. Sure. Uh, uh, Dean, I guess you, you had the privilege of seeing, you know, lots of different sort of merchants and, and consumer experiences, you know, with your role at, at Microsoft. I guess, you know, how are you seeing people adapt to the new versions and, and leverage the new versions of 3DS? Yeah, that's right, Sean. So at Microsoft, 
you know, we have different lines of business. So we have, for example, our gaming business, which is very consumer focused, um, or we have our cloud business, which is very enterprise focused. Um, you know, we have businesses that are subscription focused. So, you know, we support quite a wide range of businesses across our platform. Um, and I, I think, you know, you, you, you have 3DS version two, you know, the updated version of the protocol. And there's no doubt that 3DS version two contains improvements over 3DS one. Thomas, you know, spoke about how 3DS2 natively allows for um, frictionless um, authentication. So the issuer can decide to approve the authentication without actually, you know, stepping up the customer for a challenge. And, and that's certainly a, um, you know, a really important feature of the protocol. Um, but the devil's always in the details, right? You know, you, you have this powerful feature, but to what extent is it used? Um, and what we've seen over the last you know, two years is we've all collectively as an industry got ready for the, um, the, the rollouts and the enforcement of strong customer authentication in Europe is that the, uh, you know, the implementation of strong customer authentication using 3DS2 as a protocol has been quite uneven. Um, and so if you look at Europe, uh, and, and of course, each merchant will experience it slightly differently based on the nature of their business. Um, but just speaking from the Microsoft perspective, you know, we see um, across Europe as a whole, we see challenge. Uh, so maybe putting the UK aside. So if you look at Europe outside of the UK, just as an example, we see challenge rates of 65 to 70%. That, you know, means at least two out of every three customers for our business anyway, are getting stepped up to challenge. Um, and if you think about that, you know, do the issuers really believe that two out of every three customers represent potential fraud? Like that doesn't really make sense, right? So why is the challenge rate so high? So, you know, if you speak to the card networks, uh, the card schemes, they will tell you that, you know, best practice should be a challenge rate down, I don't know, less than 20%, um, but the industry is not there yet. Um, and so that's, you know, just, you know, taking this one topic of challenge, right, that, that's an example where even if, you know, 3DS2 as a protocol offers an improvement over 3DS1, it's how the industry has implemented it and, you know, what you see on a real world and a day-to-day -day basis that makes a difference. The UK is a bit better that, you know, the challenge rate's a lot lower, um, although that's changing a little bit now as well with the enforcement. So, you know, maybe, maybe we can, maybe we can come onto that, but, but yeah, so, um, you know, 3DS2 definitely better than 3DS1. Um, but, but yeah, overall, you know, it's been, it's been a painful process um, for us. There's just no two ways about it. You know, you introduce something new into the payments industry and it takes a long time for the full ecosystem to, um, develop a maturity around a new a new capability a new scenario a new a new protocol and we're very much in the middle of that um so you know our our sca journey uh, has just begun and um yeah we 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 have a long way to go so thanks Dan. thank you for that uh awesome insight. i guess all about again as a as a, a different type of merchant i don't know what has your experience been similar or different uh, we've seen a couple of different things. So the, the first thing I would say is uh, between 2.1 and 2.2, our experience is that a, 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 a good implementation of 2.1 is probably delivering better results than an average implementation of 2.2. Uh, we're not really seeing um, issue a take up of all of the features within 2.2 yet. So it'll take a little while. Uh, the one thing that has made the difference for us um, is to uh, implement the TRA screening properly on our transactions. Um, so making sure that we're exempting as many transactions uh, as we can from the, from the friction flow. Uh, I, I would say our experience of the friction flow is, is a really frustrating one, to be honest. Um, uh, you know, overall, because we have a, a retail store business where we're accepting payments on chip and pin, our overall fraud rate as a business is pretty low. Um, our customer demographic gives us a, a fraud rate that is relatively low. Um, and so we're now in a situation where we are 
forced to put our best customers buying the biggest baskets through the worst process. Uh, and that's that's really causing a degree a degree of frustration for us. So um, whilst it may only be a small number of transactions that that um, don't qualify for an exemption at the higher basket size, um, that's actually a you know a not insignificant chunk of our revenue. Um, uh, and there seems to be very little we can do about that. So we're <laughs> we're doing everything everything we can. Um, I, I would say, whilst the industry overall might be seeing an impact on on fraud reduction um it's very early days to draw that conclusion and if you start from a low point anyway uh all you're really doing is making your good customers um uncomfortable and putting them through more pain than they need to yeah for sure and and you know I, I, it's really interesting you know the, the different merchant types that, you know see very different types of of sort of impact here i guess just to follow up on that a little bit i i think the you know when that is occurring and it's causing you, you know, pain, uh, and you're, you know, say you're, you're sort of giving your your best customers a bad experience. Like, like what what options do you have? Other, you know, like are there other mitigants beyond, uh, you know, just uh, just trying to you know make your card experience better? Like, what, what else does it kind of uh, lead you down? So it's driving a couple of interesting things. Uh, we've seen um, a, a little bit of tender shift. I, I wouldn't say we've seen a large amount of consumers move away from card payments to to, to PayPal or, or, or other um, buy now, pay later or wallet based solutions that we offer. Um, but those solutions have done quite well over the last over the last couple of months. How much of that is causality is sure. is, is, un, is unclear. Um, we've certainly changed the way in which we are presenting payment options to customers. Um, so what you may notice if you're an MS shopper uh, is that if you're paying on a device that supports Apple Pay, um, you may be presented with Apple Pay as your default um, in a way that maybe you weren't before if you had a different card on file. Yep. Um, you may find if, you're, if your authentication abandons that you get an email um, from us asking you to, to come back and try again that we perhaps wouldn't have, wouldn't have sent before. Um, so we're doing as much as we can to try and close the sale. Um, uh, and that's the most important thing, right? For us is our job is to sell stuff um, and improve our transaction success rate. Um, if that transaction success rate is improved by moving to a different tender type, uh, then you know that's what may have to happen in the short term. Sure, um, super interesting. And I think you know the um, I guess sort of just to expand upon that a little bit. You know, you're, you're building quite sophisticated strategies to to sort of handle what happens, you know, that, that are not just part of the payment flow, they're kind of talking to customers, I guess. Um, Thomas, are you sort of seeing uh, others, you know, try and think about that in the same way? Yeah, well, I think the key consideration still has to be maximizing conversion rates and minimizing card abandonment because, I mean, fraud is an issue, but I mean, it's not breaking any organizations, uh, neither on the, the issue in acquiring side or on the, on the merchant side. So, I mean, it's it's a problem, but it's one that a lot of organizations in the past just kind of put off at the cost of doing business, uh, of it, um, obviously. Now, um, the, the strategy is quite important, and I think that will really take some time. And we have heard the better you are prepared, the, the more seamless that experience obviously goes. But I think what we haven't really seen yet, or what's now only developing momentum as more and more transactions are obviously go, have to go through the SCA process, exemptions will also increase. And I think that is really where there is still a lot of potential to really create more seamless experiences and particularly for customers that are that you know that are recurring customers that you um, so for instance the, the trusted uh, beneficiary exemptions would allow uh, a, a customer to request that you as a merchant can be um, exempt. So that will happen if they are a loyal customer and they they shop a lot and they do not just want to go low and buy less than what is it thirty dollars um, uh, in in their in their card. So I think these things will work themselves out over time as we get the hang of doing it. Then there's obviously a couple of technology solutions that will also help because they make it just easier along the process. And the third element is really the consumers will also learn. They will know what documents or what, what, well, what 
how, how to maneuver in their ops and, and what they need to do to basically pass SCA, um, SCA approval. So I think these are really the things that will evolve over time. I mean, there's always a transition period where there is friction and the friction will go up and you will see increased card abandonment, but these will work themselves out over time because the need to pay is not going away. And I cannot imagine that over time, this will really drive transactions away from cards towards uh, some, some of the other payment types. In the short term, that might happen, uh, particularly as merchants get really smart about it and figure this works better for me than that. But over time, I think this will really even out. And particularly as the, the offerings, now everybody is still in that learning cycle. As this is getting hammered out, I think we really see some, uh, well, first drop off SCA um, rates, as well as obviously a much more seamless experience as everybody gets a better hang of it. And last but not least, I think, I mean, SCA is just one part of that payment process. So as we are all, I mean, every, everybody is kind of ramping up their investments in fraud monitoring tools. These tools get smarter, they get more efficient, and that will also allow them to, to push the exemptions further without really causing more risk in the process. Great, thank you. Um, Dean, I, I guess, you know, we, in the UK, we, you know, this month we've seen uh, the, the sort of the ramp up of the of, of, uh, of people turning, uh, the issuers, you know, um, re, re, sort of responding to the deadline, which has been like, we've, you know, we've certainly seen, you know, a, a big swing in, in terms of all the companies that are enforcing SEA. Um, have you seen that, you know, what's been your UK experience with that mandate passing and, and interested in, in your observations there? Yeah, that's right. So obviously the UK is something we've been watching closely since the start of the year, late, late last year, as they've been moving through their um, series of kind of milestone dates uh, to reach full enforcement. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, from the Microsoft side, what we've been doing is uh, reactively enabling SCA as we see that banks uh, were starting to enforce and respond with soft declines. So that's just been a, you know, progressive um, process for us. And yeah, I mean, the the main thing that I've been um, keeping an eye on in terms of monitoring uh, performance and, and sort of the key performance metrics is this, is this challenge rate that I mentioned earlier, right? So um, the UK, you know, over the last year, two years, has had a much lower challenge rate than the rest of Europe. And as a result, their, their SEA performance and the, the impact of SEA on conversion in the UK has been you know, way better um, than any other markets anywhere else in Europe. And so th that's great, but you know, we've been a little bit nervous that that might change. And so that's what we've been keeping an eye on. Um, and we have seen an increase in the challenge rate for sure. Um, you know, in, on the Microsoft side, uh, you know, for those familiar with uh, 3DS2, you'll know that the protocol has um, distinct implementations for um, web transactions versus mobile transactions. The, the, the protocol actually allows for separate implementations. And Microsoft has this funny scenario where we actually use the mobile SDK implementation on our Xbox console. Um, so, so we actually see quite different behavior and quite different performance between our web and our uh, Xbox um, uh, transactions using using the SDK approach. But um, you know, just maybe talking to the web side of things, which is probably what we would have in common with most merchants, um, we have seen the the challenge rate increase. You know, the the challenge rate was was down, you know, around twenty percent, and and it sort of increased around thirty percent, and then with the um, you know, for us, it was just looking at my charts here around uh, the February time frame. It sort of climbed up to the forty percent range um, for web. So, uh, you know, um, as the UK issuers have, you know, tightened their uh, enforcement logic, um, yep, the, the 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 challenge rate has has increased. Um, the the challenge success rate has been relatively constant. So. Um, but that runs at around sort of 50% average uh, for us. So now the more transactions that you subject to a challenge, they now receive a challenge success rate of 50%, which is then way below, you know, what, what you'd want. Um, so yes, um, th th those have been the two key things, challenge rate gone up, 
success rate been the same, but now more, more of our transactions are getting that uh, 50% success rate. And so uh, we do see an impact uh, to our to our conversion. Um, so I, I, maybe just worth expanding, uh, you sort of mentioned you, you on the Xbox, you have your sort of, uh, you're, you're able to leverage the, the mobile flow. I guess maybe for some of the listeners who aren't as familiar, well, like yeah. why, why, why is one better than the other? And, and, and what are the elements of that that are being taken into account to reduce that challenge rate? Yeah, for us on the Xbox console, it's, it's mainly a technology thing. So um, one of the sort of innovations or improvements that the 3DS version 2 protocol had over 3DS version 1 is they, they introduced, um, you know, a specific uh, protocol, a specific flow for the mobile context. You know, these days, many merchants have a, you know, mobile experience for shopping. In fact, some merchants have either mobile only or mobile first experience. Um, and so there are aspects of the uh, 3DS protocol now with version two that greatly improve the customer experience on a mobile app. And you know, if you start getting into the details, you can do really nice things between how the merchant app can hand off between the banking app and vice versa. Stuff like that. Um, so anyway, so that was a good thing. Uh, you know, for us, uh, the reason we went that route on the console, again, it was a technology thing because uh, for us, it's difficult to uh, embed um, essentially browser technology uh, on the Xbox. We have it, but it doesn't make for a great customer experience. So if we do it using the, the SDK approach, we can give a more native uh, customer experience from a you know, from a user experience point of view. So that's, that's why we did it. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I will tell you, you know, seeing as we're talking about um, 3DS version two and this, this mobile SDK approach, um, unfortunately, um, it, it turns out that when, so if we go back to, say, late 2020 and, and through 2021, when we were, testing our implementation and when i say testing we were essentially running an experiment where we'd submit a small percentage of our production traffic we'd, we'd submit it for authentication yeah. and then we would you know gather data evaluate results we noticed there was a real discrepancy between um you know the browser performance and then the 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 sdk performance from us in the console and then we worked with you know, various issuers to figure out what was going on. It turned out that many issuers had just not prioritized uh, the implementation and the testing of the, you know, the SDK flow. Yep. And we were like, whoa, like what's going on here? And so there was, you know, there was a period of time where the merchant community, um, ourselves and other large merchants, you know, worked very closely with Visa, MasterCard and, and many, many issuers to, you know, troubleshoot um, their implementation. So they, they, they were kind of behind um, on that one. You know, it's, it's, it's got better, but uh, yeah, but that, that was a sort of uh, an interesting part of the, the, the SDK journey. It's, just, it's like to the point, just because the protocol offers you something nice doesn't mean it's been well done in the real world. So for sure. And, and you know, uh, I guess the, the curse of payments, you know, with the, with the, the number of players that we have in, in the ecosystem, it takes all of them to, to line up to kind of, you know, get right. the best experience. I guess, Oliver, to you, um, I guess one, you know, comment on maybe the, 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 the ramp up in the UK, whether you've seen effects, obviously, as you say, mostly a, a kind of in-store purchase uh, company, but, you know, significant online presence as well. Uh, and I guess also to the point that, that Dean made, have you seen, you know, significant variance amongst issuers in terms of how they handle things um yes we have um so as you as you might imagine we get uh we've been looking at the success rates of challenges by different issuers um and also by the version that they that, that they have what we've noticed and i and i guess this isn't a surprise um is the those those customers of um issuers whose banking proposition is more mobile centric right so um, the, the, the kind of the new entrance, if you like, where it's very mobile centric in terms of your overall experience, you know, unsurprisingly, they have very high success rates for the challenges when they come through because the customers are used to interacting with their app. Um, when you go to a monoline issuer on credit, um, or particularly a monoline 
um, from a, you know, one of the more traditional banks with maybe a slightly more mature customer base from a demographic point of view, we see some big differences, right? So we, we know that there's you know, still a large number of customers out there um, who don't have the mobile app for their credit card. Um, in fact, um, the, the credit card issuer doesn't even have their mobile phone number to send them an OTP in some cases. Uh, and issuers were quite busy shipping out chip card readers to, for consumers to use offline. Um, and in the nicest possible way, um, you know, grandma's not going to use it, <laughs> yeah. right? And so we're, what, we've, what we've seen is um, some, some, some large differences between sort of credit and debit um, and between uh, sort of mobile-centric issuers and uh, and more and more traditional issuers in terms of the way in which those 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 payments are accepted so that's been uh, that's been that's been kind of interesting um as we as we navigate through the the, the process and uh, and what we're learning so yeah we have we have seen some some quite some quite significant differences um and, and this has this has led to a degree of frustration actually because if you if you as a consumer you probably will have been on the receiving end of some communication from your bank saying, oh, by the way, if you experience a problem um, with your transactions being declined, uh, it's not us, that's the issuer. No, no, you need to go speak to your merchant because what they're assuming is that the merchant is sending them non-compliant transactions that they're soft declining and they aren't making them back on their books. Um, whereas that might not strictly be the case. The, the case might actually be that the issuer needs to have a think about their authentication methods and their authentication processes um, and try and make sure they're investing in doing a slicker journey. So I think there is a room for consumer confusion around who do I call if this isn't, if this isn't working? Do I call my bank? Cause it's my, it's the bank card that I'm using, but they've sent me an email saying, don't call them. Yeah. Um, uh, they're telling me to contact the merchant. Half these merchants don't have a phone number. And even if they did, it'll take them an hour and a half to answer the phone at the moment. So what am I going to do? Uh, so I think there's, you know, there is, a, teething troubles is probably a polite way of putting it. And I think as an industry, there's still quite a lot of room for improvement in producing a, a consumer experience that is consistent and, and well understood and is not, you know, making the consumer feel like they're being passed from pillar to post if, if, it's, uh, if they're having challenges with it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and I guess, you know, you've sort of mentioned that you're, you, you've built up sort of new new ways of communicating your customers. Maybe you're, you're usually sending an email to kind of pick up a journey. Is there sort of, are there other things that you're you're looking at or, or sort of potential other mitigants that you can look at that, that will enable you to, to go beyond the, the just the, the, you know, the, 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 the payment flow? Um, well, obviously there's, uh, there's other payment tender types, right? <laughs> Yep. Um, uh, and the way in which we promote and present uh, the payment options to the customer uh, is starting is starting to gain a little bit more attention as we think through um, what is the um, to Dean's point, right? What we want is to sell more stuff, right? What we care about is the transaction success rate. Yep. Um, so, what route or method? Um, should I send this payment through that gives me the highest chance of success? Yeah. Uh, and, and that's, that's perhaps where, you know, we're thinking slightly differently about our orchestration at the back, at the back end about whether we've got the right partners um, for, for the acquiring journey or for the gateway journey as well uh, to try and optimize our chance of our chance of success. Yeah. Um, and that becomes increasingly important at that higher basket size where we can't use an exemption and we know that we're going to have to put them through what could be if they are the customer of a bank who doesn't have their mobile phone number, um, quite an uncomfortable and painful journey. Sure. And just to, just to expand on that and be a, little, be a little bit more explicit, I guess you're, you're, you're talking about partners having uh, you know sufficiently low fraud uh, rates across their books so that they can offer TRA to you as a, as a, as a merchant. Is that right? Yeah, so I, I, I think we're really fortunate um, uh, in this regard, because if you look at, um, if you take a merchant that's got a large retail store base, um, then they're going to have quite a low fraud rate because of all the EMV chip and pin transactions that they're doing, right? So we're not an e-commerce pure play. Yep. Um, 
So, you know, 20 odd percent of our business is, is e-commerce, but the rest is the rest comes from our stores. That net net gives us um, a relatively low fraud rate, um, which gets us to think, well, never before have we really thought about the acquirer fraud rate and what that means for us, right? Um, so, you know, we, you know, we would like to think that we're going to lower the fraud rate of any acquirer net net that, um, that who takes our traffic. Um, but if there were acquirers who specialized in lower risk merchants uh, and we were able to match retailers with acquirers with similar profiles, um, then maybe we could get a higher TRA exemption and, uh, and you know, put fewer of our best customers through an uncomfortable journey that we don't have to. Yeah, for sure. Um, well, well, Oliver, maybe, um, you know, the other side of that is uh, merchants like Microsoft, maybe with a slightly higher fraud rate than uh, Marks and Spencer, we need to, you know, team up so that we can uh, ride on the back of your super uh, wonderful low <laughs> fraud rate <laughs> so yeah. that we can, you know, steal some of your, uh, you know, the benefits of your, uh, you know, what you what you help the acquire qualify for. Which is, you know, I'm there's a, there's a, <laughs> an arbitrage of risk between. Uh, right. Yeah, it's something we've never had to think about before. Right. right? Um, uh, it does. It does. It does create a different dynamic in the acquiring market. Whereas, whereas in the past, you might have chosen your acquirer on the basis of uh, success rate of transactions or decline rates or um, or, or economic pricing. Uh, increasingly, the metric of uh, of the, success, the overall what? success rate and 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 what that means from a TRA point of view right. what uh, level suddenly they? suddenly becomes a a, a a really interesting dynamic. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we and, we have we. We, sorry, I was going to say we, we have a new acquirer in Europe that we we don't really send a lot of uh, our traffic to at the moment, and they were sort of very proudly came to us the other week and said, "Oh, you know, we qualify now for the top, um, uh, you know, TRA level. I think it's five hundred euros, right?" Um, and I was like, yeah, well, wait until we start sending you some more traffic. You might lose that qualification. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, send you do, send you know? them our way. We should have right, a chat. Right, right, right. <laughs> no, but I mean, that, that is the beauty uh, of it. I mean, it injects some, some new level of differentiation in the uh, market. And I think there is really opportunity to for, for both sides to optimize that and build uh, a value proposition around that. And ultimately, lower fraud rates, every, everybody will benefit from it, uh, as long as it doesn't really affect your conversion rate that massively. But I mean, there will be, and, and we've been talking to a lot of acquirers uh, on, on that topic, because it suddenly matters, your fraud score matters, it's really important to keep that in mind. Uh, and and uh, to, to really look at that from an ecosystem approach, when you build your strategy, who do you want to do business with? So I think this is really important to, to consider. It's, it's becoming more strategic. Well, I, I do just want to chip something in here. Like I, I don't imagine that Marks and Spencer have this problem, um, but I know there are plenty of other merchants, you know, in the broader merchant community that do. And it relates to the topic of, what we call first party misuse, um, what's also sometimes referred to as friendly fraud. You know, so you, <laughs> you have someone who's playing FIFA on the Xbox and they purchase the, I don't know what it's properly called, but it's like you, you purchase a pack of players. Uh, so like you pay 10 bucks and then you get like five players and then Ronaldo isn't in the pack. So you don't want the pack anymore. So you then, you know, charge back you know, you open a dispute uh, with your with your issuer to, <laughs> to say, I don't know what you say, but like basically you say you don't want to pay. Um, yeah, so so then the Microsoft as a merchant gets a charge back. It's like, but hang on, that uh, this wasn't fraud. Like someone didn't steal your credit card and, you know, do a transaction. This is you just abusing, you know, um, our, uh, our ecosystem here. So anyway, we, we get a lot of that. Like, like, um, you know, the, the vast majority of Microsoft's fraud is this, this first, first party misuse. Yeah. Um, mm. Unfortunately, you know, because fraud rates are calculated, you know, based on disputes from the issuer side and then Visa MasterCard use that, um, it, it kind of, it's all in there. And so, you know, we there's this whole separate sort of discussion that we're having within the industry and, and with the card networks around how to distinguish that and how to think about that and how to, you know, um, 
But yeah, yeah, I think that's a you know a perfect uh, conversation for another webinar. But yeah, and and to right. as well. <laughs> but 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 the reason whole, I wanna... yeah, that that wasn't that wasn't saying let's not talk about it. I think it's, yeah. a, it's a super interesting subject and actually so, anyway. Yeah. Right. But but, yeah. but you know, SDA doesn't necessarily help you there. You know, yeah. so yeah. Um, I mean, maybe it can, but not necessarily anyway. Yeah. 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 Uh, just to play devil's advocate here as well. I mean, it is, and I think it's also an opportunity because we have this, this host of new payment types becoming available, particularly account-based payments. And so far, I think merchants have not been extremely open to, to kind of enable those. And I think moving forward, they become more attractive as well because they might not be subject to the same SCA requirements. And I mean, particularly for recurring payments, direct debit is an amazing option. It is a different process, uh, but it has very, very powerful capabilities. Same goes for RTP. And as we kind of, I mean, it's always traffic moves wherever there's the least resistance. And that goes both for attackers as well as for consumers or merchants or anyone, essentially. But it will increase competition. And I think that will also kind of nudge us potentially in the right direction to, to really embrace some of these new innovative payment, payment types that become available simply because we can and we have so just, just expanding on that, and I think picking up on a, on a really interesting point that, that, that Oliver made about how um, issuers and banks, you know, are presenting different experiences to customers that, um, you know, increases their ability to, uh, you know, actually, you know, have a more seamless transaction journey. Do you think it's also then the issuers and the bank's responsibility to also promote those payment, uh, different payment options and provide, you know, those experiences as well? What's that question like, for me? Yeah, yeah. So just sort of saying like, you know, the, the role of the, of the bank in, in helping promote those different payment types as well. Well, essentially, yes, it is their, part of their job. I mean, it requires a lot of education to kind of promote those new payment types on both ends, whether that's merchants, whether that's consumers. And uh, ultimately, there has to be a business case as well. Otherwise, the merchants won't move. Uh, now, obviously, reducing friction, that's a pretty good business case. Um, lower transaction cost, if the costs go up on, a, on the other end, is also a, a more important consideration. So I think it's... I, I wouldn't go as far that this is necessarily the, the bank's strategy to move away, move away from card payments because I mean most of the many of them are issuers and they uh, yeah shoot their own legs so to speak and uh, there is a big con uh, fear about cannibalization a really profitable business line but at the same time the industry is changing, the, the way consumers want to pay is changing, and they do want to, I mean, and, and data in essence is what these new payment type will enable us because they provide more data. And on those on the, these data points, we can run better fraud analytics, but we can also run different services on them or different analytics, which might benefit the overall customer experience or our marketing efficiency. Uh, so it's, a long journey. Um, there are many, many reasons that drive you in the one or the other direction. But I think overall, my point is really that now more intense competition and some of the newer payment types maybe becoming more attractive is really, really valuable in this in this market situation at the moment. Right. Thank you. I guess um, you know, sort of uh, getting to the the. the reported point of, of, of introducing uh, SEA is kind of you know, the effect on fraud rates, I guess, you know, interested to you know, maybe start with you, Dean. Like, have you seen a, you know, a, you know, a fall in fraud as a result of, 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 of these uh, changes? No, not really. <laughs> okay. I mean, <laughs> I'm, being, I'm, I'm being pithy, but I mean, no, I think sure. that's, no, that's a point. No, I mean, <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, through 2020, we would through, you know, industry advocacy groups we had the chance to chat to folks from the european commission and like you know we try to make the point that you know you guys are i don't know what, what's the right metaphor i don't know like square peg in a round hole or maybe like you know it's like you got this like nail and a very big hammer but a you know, i think we a that, sledge the hammer is, uh, is yes a, you know, that's what yeah. i was looking for yeah, yeah. exactly you know and it's like guys you know yeah, sure. Like, I mean, you, you can, I mean, obviously, like if, if you, if you, if you 
leverage SEA as part of your fraud toolkit. And, you know, as a merchant, when you evaluate the risk of a transaction, you know, to decide whether you want, whether it's fraud or not. And, and, and then you have um, strong customer authentication as an option. Like if you think this is a risky transaction, okay, great. Let's submit this for, you know, strong customer authentication with a request to do a step up challenge. Um, so it can be a useful tool, but, but, but what about fraud rates? Like they're tiny. You know, are we talking, I don't know, Marks and Spencer, less than five basis points. In our case, you know, 10, 20, 30 basis points. Like, I mean, so, so, so you can move the needle on this like tiny, tiny sliver of basis points, you know, whereas, I mean, we've seen it's impacted our conversion rate to the tune of two, three, four percentage points. Um, so it's like, you know, um, yeah, maybe um, SCA yeah. has helped our fraud a teeny little bit and, and maybe we can use it in the future, especially maybe out, outside of the, the uh, outside of Europe. But, um, but no, uh, you know, this, this idea that um, everything is wonderful because it's made such a good impact on our fraud rate. It's just like, no, no, no. You know, mm -hmm. the, the real story here is, is the price we pay on conversion. So. Sure. Oliver, I, I suspect um, we may hear a similar story from you, but, but can interest to get your opinion on that. Uh, yeah, zero impact um, uh, as far as as far as far as fraud concerned from a very low base in the first place, right? Yeah. Um, uh, it doesn't it doesn't mean we shouldn't deploy all kinds of tools to 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 look carefully at every transaction and and work closely with our with our partners. But um, if the if the objective here was to uh, to reduce our fraud rate, um, then that objective has not been successful. Great. And um, so one last question before we sort of move on to maybe some of the questions that uh, from the audience, I guess, um, you know, we've talked a lot about Europe. Um, you know, how do you, are you seeing, uh, how are you seeing the rollout elsewhere in the world? You know, uh, are you seeing similar trends? Are you seeing, you know, the, the regulators and, and others moving in different, in the same sort of direction? Just interested in how you, uh, how you're looking at that. Maybe um, Oliver, I know you're mostly a UK business, but obviously have a, a fair amount of uh, international business as well. Just, uh, you know, your opinion on, on that. Um, so probably the, um, the the most telling is is the Republic of Ireland, uh, where we do have quite a, a significant presence there. Um, significantly smaller than you, than the UK business, but um, the the challenge success rate in there has been particularly poor. Right. Uh, and again, we 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 put that down to uh, issue of preparedness. Um, and no doubt the issuer community would say it's all down to merchant readiness, <laughs> and this is this is this is part of the problem. Um, but you know there are a lot of Irish consumers there who are not using their mobile banking app, and therefore yeah. the authentication journey is um, is 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 painful or slow or incomplete. So um, you know, the good news, I mean, the, the the nightmare scenario for us was that the UK business would mirror the Irish business in terms of lost volume. Yeah. Um, thankfully that hasn't that hasn't materialized um but you know, let's 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 be clear about this right this is this sca it is costing us lost sales right we are um you know we are seeing abandonment rates really really high the couple of things that we're seeing that's just worth making and uh, making a point on um so although something like, let's pick a, a, an average number, say 25% of the friction authentication challenges don't complete. That doesn't turn into 25% of lost sales for us. We're seeing customers try five or six times um, before giving up entirely. Yep. Um, so yeah, we are losing, we are losing business. Um, but customers are trying five or six different times. Uh, they're using different payment mechanisms. You know, they, they clearly want to shop with us and complete the transaction. Um, so we want to make it as, as seamless as possible for them to do that. Fortunately, our implementation in the UK um, seems to be performing very, very well, even though, you know, we're still losing sales that we would like, would like to keep. Um, and our experience is that the UK seems to perform better than some of the other European markets where we're present. Dean probably has a has, a, has all the numbers on that, <laughs> um, uh, but you know that's our experience. Sure. Dean, I guess yeah, obviously, I mean, like you, you, know, you probably got a, a sort of a wider, broader international spread. So, like, what are you what are you seeing? 
Yeah, that's right. So um, I, I think a helpful way to think about it is like, as you look around the world, you need to keep an eye on which markets are following a, what you could say is like a regulatory approach, similar to what Europe did. Right. So India is an example there. They're not on 3DS2, they're 3DS1, but, you know, they have regulations there now where you have to, you know, do, do strong customer authentication. Um, Australia is another market that seems to be following a regulatory approach through their sort of industry payments body, Auspaynet. Um, so, yeah, if you're a global merchant, you definitely need to have your pulse on, you know, which countries are going to require SCA from a regulatory perspective similar to what Europe did. Now, what, I mean, what we see is that it, it doesn't necessarily exactly the same as Europe. Like Australia, they're not doing it as blanket like uh, Europe did. Um, there, they're more talking about, well, if you've got a fraud rate above this, then we're going to expect you to do some SCA. And so they're yeah, the, the, the nuances are different, but but you but you do have this basic idea that they're going to be uh, you know regulation uh, driven requirements for S, for SEA in, in different parts of the world. Um, beyond that, it's um, it's more about you know are there are there other opportunities that SEA offers? You know whether it's dealing with fraud um, because SEA can be a, a really useful tool if there's some markets where you do see high fraud, or maybe you're a merchant that operates in high fraud categories, or you have, you, yeah, you have high, high fraud sort of categories of what you sell. Like for us, you know, sometimes when we sell hardware, it's like these you know, high, high ticket items. Um, <clears throat> or there might be other interesting opportunities. You know, one I can mention is like in Brazil, um, in Brazil, you can't use debit cards online because there's a regulation that, you know, uh, around, um, around what's required for security, but uh, 3DS actually solves that problem. Um, and so we've been looking at Brazil as a way to essentially expand our, um, our acceptance footprint, you know, moving beyond debit uh, credit cards to also debit cards. It's kind of like a, like a business growth opportunity there. And that was an interesting thing. What I will say is that, you know, if there's one lesson for me from Europe is that there's no shortcut to a good SCA implementation using 3DS2. Like you've got to go through the, you know, you, you've got to do the work to test it out end to end. Um, you know, merchants need to collaborate. Issuers need to collaborate. In Brazil, they actually did a pretty nice job. Like the Payments Association um, funded like a consultancy to, facilitate a forum with issuers and merchants um, and we actually over the course of a almost a year you know we're just like progressively testing with like all the major banks in brazil now that's an expensive process right because you've got to do this work but you know at the end of it you iron out the problems and you you get to a better place before you then light it all up you know europe was the opposite regulation forced us to light it all up so um yeah, that's that's what I'd say. You know, um, like like the industry and uh, you know, Visa, Mastercard, they're, they're sensitive to this, but they're not. You know, that they're not really facilitating uh, sort of industry end to end sort of testing and collaboration exactly. Um, they are trying to incentivize a move towards SCA with how they set fees on disputes and. You know transactions that have been, you know, subject to uh, um, submitted for authentication. Those that haven't, um, uh, but yeah, I mean that that's basically yeah. you know how I think about it: regulated driven versus non-regulated driven. And then in a particular market, like how do you actually go about it so that the implementation becomes successful? And that's got to have some sort of collaboration and testing. Sure, thank you. And, and Thomas, can give you the last word on this before we uh, close. Sure. Um, so I just wanted to say a response to something that Oliver Steely uh, mentioned earlier when he was talking about the impact that it has, and that it's not a positive one. And that is welcome to the world of financial services because we have new regulations every year that <laughs> are helping, helping not. I mean, that's a different discussion, but they force you to do stuff. And it's always taking some time to make it work. It's a lot of pro uh, work that goes into it. And as, as Dean was saying, you have to do the hard work. And I think while this regulatory-led approach that we have in Europe is kind of moving us, inching us forward, it's a very prescriptive process. It kind of stifles innovation to some degree. On the other hand, 
it, it creates a level playing field. And I think, I mean, each, each approach has their own benefits. And um, I mean, when you look into other regions, um, I think very often we assume because uh, that Europe is leading in so many areas and SEA is another one of those examples where Europe feels it's leading. But when you look at uh, adoption of 3DS 2.2, it's not leading any longer. I mean, those are, it's much more common in the US these days where, because they caught up. Uh, and the other, the rest of the world is also catching up. So it is um, not as clear cut um, to that respect. Obviously, we are preoccupied with kind of being compliant now. Um, that is uh, inhibitor maybe in the short term, but I think it really levels the entire industry up. And I think that in the long term will ho hopefully have a positive impact if it's really being to be felt that much in uh, moving from low fraud rates to extremely low fraud rates. Yeah, I mean, that is a benefit. If it's worth all the hack -mack, I that's for <laughs> everyone to decide themselves, I guess. Great, thank you. Um like I just say, thank you very much for your insight and, and honesty and frankness and, and uh, sort of the, you know, what we've been discussing. I think it's been, you know, super insightful and uh, I really thank you that. Thank you for everyone who's um, uh, who's uh, joined the call as well. I think we're just out of time and so, uh, and we haven't got any questions. So um, we'll call it an end there. And again, so thank you very much. And uh, hopefully uh, we'll get to do one of these uh, soon again.